we've been studying the book of Genesis and uh, we are now to the point of chapter 6 in the book which talks about the flood and so I have titled my study this morning the rains came down we're going to skip chapter 5 of the book of Genesis a chapter that I call the begats so and so begat so and so and he begat so and so we want only to point out that in chapter 5 it shows that man lived a long long time right after creation in fact, they lived a long time right up until the flood. And yet, in spite of the length of their lives, they still died. Now, Satan had told Eve in the garden, you won't die, you won't die. You'll just get more knowledge. But, chapter 5 says that they still died. In the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And all of them died except one. Genesis 5, 21 to 24, talks about a man named Enoch. And Hebrews 11, verse 5, elaborates on Enoch. It says, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God translated him. For before his testimony, he had this testimony that he pleased God and from the sweet lady with the red books this spiritual insight in the midst of a world by its iniquity doomed to destruction Enoch lived a life of such close communion with God that he was not permitted to fall under the power of death the godly character of this prophet represents the style of holiness which must be attained by those who shall be redeemed from the earth at the time of Christ's second advent. But that's another story. We're just illustrating the chapter, in, in chapter 5, the fact that men lived a long time prior to the flood. In fact, verse 32 says that Noah's three sons came along when Noah was 500 years old. And yet, in spite of their longevity, the Bible says that they still died. And in the story of the flood, which covers three chapters, chapters 6, 7, and 8, we see a very real demonstration of the wages of sin. The ultimate lesson of the flood is that the result of a sin of our first parents Adam and Eve is practically the opposite of creation. Sin makes chaos out of order. Sin returns that which is alive to lifelessness. For at the flood, the earth was very nearly returned to the state of being formless, vacant, and dark, just like it was prior to creation. Of a necessity, we're going to cover this story uh, this morning and we're going to begin with the first scripture for the morning it's first six verses of chapter six Genesis chapter six the first six verses now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, and yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. 
Then the Lord God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them from the earth. The first four verses are an introduction to the flood story. And very interesting verses they are indeed. And on top of that, these verses have been greatly misunderstood. This is illustrated, I think, by a conversation that I had with a member of one of the churches that I pastored. His take was that the giants in the earth was the result of the sons of God, which he said were angels, the sons of God, which he said were angels, having sexual relationships with the daughters of men who he said were the human beings that had been created. So he said, you have angels having sexual relationships with humans, and the end result is the giants in the earth. The real explanation of this text applies to the descendants of Cain and the descendants of Abel. Of Abel. Let me uh, exaggerate. After the death of Abel, Seth was born. And Seth was faithful after the order of Abel. And Seth's descendants were more and more faithful as time passed. His descendants were in harmony with the will of God. They lived in the will of God. And thus the children of Abel through Seth were the children of God spoken about in these verses. The children of Abel through Seth were the children of God spoken about in these verses. On the other hand, Cain's descendants were, walk, were walking after the flesh. They were not God's children because they were not living in harmony with the will of God. They were, therefore, the children of men. The sons of God taking the daughters of men simply means that the descendants of Abel and the descendants of Cain were intermarrying. And the intermarriage between these two who were faithful and those who were unfaithful precipitated the rise of wickedness and violence on the earth, and it hastened the coming of the flood. In intermarrying, they became involved even in the practice of polygamy, following the example of Cain and his descendants. This polygamy resulted in offspring who, following the example of their parents, became even more wicked and more violent. In 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 16, the Bible says that believers should, quote unquote, not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And when you look at what was going on immediately prior to the flood, you can understand why God had such concerning regarding the relationships that he wanted his people to be involved in. When they, his children, engaged in alliances that were so obviously wrong, 
they place themselves in positions where, in order for harmony to be maintained, principles would have to be compromised. Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers because principle is going to be compromised. If no compromise is required, if both parties are pulling in the same direction, then the yoke is an equal yoke. But we have only to look at the flood to see the end result of being unequally yoked. You see, there's a real sequence developing in the story of the flood. Intermarriage between these two disparate groups leads to polygamy and compromise. And with polygamy and compromise, you have the rapid expansion of the race. And with a rapid expansion of the race, you have an exponential increase in wickedness and violence. And the increase of wickedness and violence then hastens the flood. And this brings us to the story of the flood. The story of the flood begins with the reasons for it. And the few verses that we've just read list five reasons for the flood. Reason number one for the flood comes from verse five. It says, the wickedness of man was great. Reason number one. The word wickedness that is used here has to do in the Hebrew with depravity and immorality. It is being morally insensible to what is right and true and honest. You can't tell the difference anymore. It is being so enslaved by sin that sin has lost its sinfulness. It is practicing evil and counting evil as right because the mind has become so numbed by wickedness that it can hardly tell the difference between right and wrong and good and evil. The wickedness of man was great. Reason number two is just kind of like it. It has more or less a natural result from the first. It also comes from verse five. And it says, every imagination of the thoughts of the heart is only evil continually. And the word imagination in the Hebrew there means literally device or formation. Device or formation formation. Therefore, imagination refers to evil thoughts as a product of an evil heart. Evil thoughts as a product of an evil heart. Christ said, out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. And then he made the observation that evil thoughts proceeding from an evil mind devise murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies, Matthew 15, 19. And the point is that sooner or later, a contaminated heart infects the entire life and results in the formation of sin. In this case, the formation of sin was continual. Literally, in the Hebrew, every day or all day long, in today's language, we would say 24-7. And if this is not total depravity, how else could human language describe it? With very few exceptions, there is nothing but evil. Not temporary evil, but evil always. And it was not in the case of merely a few, but in this instance, it was in society as a whole. Everyone was involved. And they were involved all the time. Peter, in 2 Peter 3, verse 5, says that it came about because they were willingly ignorant of God's word. Do you want to keep the flood from happening? Do you want to stay the flood? Then study the word. These people were willingly ignorant of God's word. The word sanctifies. We need to study the word and we can stay the flood. 
The Bible says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he who keeps the law, happy is he. That's reason number two. Reason number three comes from verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God. The earth also was corrupt before God. This means that the sinful condition of man prior to the flood is now said to have affected the whole earth, even the created things and nature itself. They are all now included. And I wouldn't be surprised, I don't know, it's pure conjecture, but this may be where the great beasts, the dinosaurs, came from. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. But it may be because the whole earth is now affected. As man practiced their evil imaginations, their evil devisings, they included animal and plant life. The result on nature was the same as it was on man, and that was total, de uh, total corruption, total depravity. The earth also was corrupt before God or in his presence. A creation that was made perfect, imagine it, has now become defiled and made imperfect by a nature tainted with evil as a result of the fall of man. Reason number four also comes from verse 11. The earth was filled with violence. That is, violence as a way of life. Violence that benumbs the soul to the point that it, craves, that it craves more violence. Violence that is satisfied by violence. Violence that thrives on greater amounts of violence. Listen to this commentary. Whoever coveted the wives or the possessions of his neighbor took them by force, and man exulted in their deeds of violence. They delighted in destroying the life of animals, and the use of flesh for food rendered them still more cruel and bloodthirsty until they came to regard human life with astonishing indifference. Isn't it interesting that the sweet lady with the red books ties the eating of, food, of flesh foods before the flood to the violence that filled the earth? And therein, I think, is the link to the story or the theory of evolution. <clears throat> you see, evolution teaches that man is nothing more nor less than an animal. A little different from the other animals that roam the earth because he has evolved to a higher estate, but he is still an animal nonetheless. And you see, if man is simply an animal, then he can be treated as an animal. He has no more value than an animal. And animals are there for our pleasure. And we can treat them any way that we want. We can kill them at our pleasure and eat them if that's what we want to do. And so we treat animals, not only animals, but also man as if they were created for our pleasure. Because man is nothing more nor less than an animal. And so, if man does not meet our standard for him, then because we kill animals, we can kill man as well. And may I remind you that 95 plus percent of all abortions are done for cosmetic reasons. The unborn child would present too heavy a burden for us to carry at this time. And so we just get rid of it as though it were an animal that no longer served our purpose. And if I'm offending you, I'm sorry. But I read just this week of a young lady who went into a hotel alone, had a baby by herself in the bathroom, went to the window and threw it out from the 25th floor. if man does not meet our standard for him. Then because we can kill animals, 
They can kill man as well. Reason number five comes from verse 12. All flesh had corrupted his way. That is God's way. All flesh had corrupted God's way upon the earth. In the Hebrew, this is a direct reference to idolatry and the worship of idols in the Hebrew. And the depth of degradation that they reached bears out the principle involved that by beholding we become changed. This is to say simply that we will become like that thing which we worship. I can read that to you in the New Testament. It's found in Romans 1, verse 20, 26, and 28. Romans 1, 20, 26, and 28. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. We can understand what God is like. But it says, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their, na even their women exchanged the natural use for that which is against nature. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Now, why did we bring these reasons, these causes to your attention? And why did we emphasize them to the degree that we did? And the answer is that we did it for two reasons. Number one is that we wanted to show that the destruction of the world by means of the flood and the destruction of all the evil and all the wickedness and all the corruption and all the violence in it was not, listen to me now, was not an arbitrary act on God's part. Sin had become so prevalent and so widespread that God really had no other choice. Were sin allowed to continue at its present rate, the evil devised by man would have destroyed not only the earth, but man himself. And to that end, the flood then was an act of love, no less than an act of judgment. For the conditions of man's heart demanded that God's judgment should put a check on sin. What would you guess? would be the greatest demonstration that the flood was not an arbitrary act on God's part. And the answer is Genesis 6, 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man forever, for he is indeed, and his days, he is indeed flesh, and his days shall be 120 years. And here it is. In 2 Peter 2, verse 5, God calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. And verse 3 says that the flood didn't come until 120 years after the warning had been given. And the faithfulness of Noah and the building of the boat on dry ground in a world that had never seen rain, for the earth had been watered by a mist prior to the flood. In a world that had never seen rain, Building a boat on dry ground was a sermon that continued for the 120 years it took to build the ark. For all of those years, as Noah sawed and hammered and pounded on that boat, he told of God's love and mercy. And if they would only listen, if they would only make changes in their lives, if they would only cast out their evil imaginings, if they would only bring their harmony into God's will, they had an ark of safety. For 120 years, Noah explained that there was a, a way to escape the judgments of God. He told them that there was an ark of safety by which their lives could be preserved. All they had to do was to accept it by faith 
and enter into it by faith. And we're going to use reason number two as an appeal for our morning. Reason number two is an appeal for our message this morning. We emphasize the reasons for the flood because of what Jesus said in Matthew 24 regarding the nature of the second coming. Matthew 24, verse 36 to 39. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all the way, all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. That's one reason we do it. And another reason is because of what Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 5 to 7. 2 Peter 3, 5 to 7. Peter says, For this they willingly forget, willingly forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But, listen again, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Listen to my favorite author. The sins that called for vengeance upon the antediluvian world still exist today. The fear of God is banished from the hearts of men, and his law is treated with indifference and contempt. The worldliness of that generation is equaled by that of the generation now living. But remember this, my friends. God's love and mercy has been preached for more than 120 years, since the 1880s. We need, therefore, to listen to the message and to make changes in our lives that will bring our will into harmony with the will of God. We need to look to the cross and see that in Jesus Christ, hanging there, there is a way to escape God's judgments. In Christ, there is an ark of safety by which our lives can be preserved. All we have to do is accept Jesus by faith and enter into Christ by faith. Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. We also have been warned. We cannot use ignorance as an excuse. It has also been explained to us that we have an ark of safety. Jesus Christ is our Savior. Through Christ, we have become heirs of the righteousness which is by faith. Through his grace, we can enter in and be saved. Jesus is our ark. Father in heaven, There's not coming a flood upon the earth again, but the earth has been reserved for fire. And just as there was an ark of safety for those in the time of the flood, there was an ark of safety now from the fire that will come. Jesus Christ is our righteousness. In his name we pray, amen.